Pericardium is a sac around the heart with two layers. There's always a small amount of fluid between the two layers, allowing them to move with respect to each other. But if additional fluid collects, it's referred to as a pericardial effusion. The additional fluid causes the intrapericardial pressure to increase, which then opposes the pressures within the heart, and they can affect its performance. The most life-threatening and dangerous of these being cardiac tamponade, which could be fatal if it's not recognised and managed quickly enough. So this is what a pericardial effusion looks like. It's this black layer here between the two layers of the pericardium. So this may be blood, it may be fluid, it may be pus, or it may be a combination. Echo can't tell the difference. And the other thing we need to be aware of, so whilst we've got pericardial effusion here, we've got another layer outside that which looks like fat. And we see this increasingly in our patients. Just notice the echogenicity of that, how different it looks to the pericardial fluid. So if we find fluid around the heart, it's worth thinking about five things. There's lots of questions that are going to head your way now, so it's good that you've got the answers ready, or ideally that you've put them in your echo report. And the first question is going to be, is it really pericardial and not plural? So this patient actually has both. There's a pericardial effusion here and a plural effusion there. And the way that I can distinguish between them is to check the position of the descending aorta. So a pericardial effusion will be anterior to the descending aorta and a pleural will typically come behind it and may come even be further behind it here. We want to think about the size of the effusion. So the hemodynamic effect is not directly related to size in that a small, quickly accumulating effusion can be worse hemodynamically than a larger chronic one. However, once you've found a pericardial effusion, chances are you're going to be rescanning this patient either to show that the effusion is getting worse or it's getting better. So it's useful to have some measurements to compare with as you monitor the patient. They're also useful for giving an indication of the severity. So, for example, less than a centimetre, we'd say was a small effusion. A moderate effusion would be between one and two centimetres and a large effusion, more than two centimetres. So in this view... This effusion looks moderate to me. We're going to want to think about the distribution of the effusion. Now, they typically start posteriorly. And if you think about that, the patient is like to be lying or sitting. So they will collect at the back of the heart. But as the effusion gets worse, it will start creeping upwards and surround the heart as it goes more anteriorly. It's also worth noting whether the patient has a loculated effusion, so that's whether there are sort of pockets of it or whether it is all linked together like this, because that has an effect if you're going to drain the effusion. You don't want to get stuck in a pocket and you can't drain the whole amount of fluid. And this is the big question. Does the patient have signs of tamponade? Obviously this is a clinical decision, but transthoracic echo signs can be really helpful. So in this subcostal view we can see there's a large effusion we can see that the right ventricle is small, so that's telling us that the pressure between the pericardial layers is such that it's stopping this right ventricle from expanding during diastole, but it's also furthermore causing the free wall to collapse in diastole. So this is a worrying sign. The right-sided chambers are likely to be affected before the left with collapse like this, but it can happen on the left side as well. We can look at the mitral Dopplers. So this is using pulse wave Doppler at the tips of the mitral valve in the four chamber view. What we're doing is recording the peak velocity, so the E wave, in inspiration and expiration. We've reduced the sweep speed so we can get lots of complexes in our waveform. And we're going to look at the difference between these two. So what happens is that we get a reduced velocity on inspiration. And if this is more than 25% or 30%, that suggests we've got signs of tamponade. And in this example, it's 27%. So that's making us worry that we could have tamponade. You can do the same for the tricuspid valve, where the increase occurs on inspiration and the cutoff there is 40%. The IVC is very useful. So this is a subcostal view focusing on the IVC. So we've got a dilated IVC that isn't collapsing very well with a sniff. So this is a worrying sign. And then the other question you're going to be asked is, can we drain it percutaneously? So usually the needle would probably come in around here and you would usually want to have ideally two centimetres here to position the needle. You may get away with one centimetre. And if that isn't the case, an alternative drainage site may be better. You can actually use contrast 
to check you're in the fusion itself. So it's worth keeping your echo machine around during drainage. It can be quite hard to give a firm opinion on tamponade based on echo. The Doppler variations can occur with other pathologies and some of the changes, there could be tiny changes on septal motion, are quite difficult to spot. So as long as you've answered the five questions and you've got your images to be able to give an answer, you can always ask someone else to make that call. So I hope you liked this video. Absolutely make sure to check out the course this video was taken from and to register for a free trial account which will give you access to selected chapters of the course. If you want to learn how MetMastery can help you become a great clinician, make sure to watch the About MetMastery video. So thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon.